Man, there's nothing more frustrating than having to hear your own voice about 8 billion times, but I guess I'm going to do it again. This is Thunderdork.com. Um, today we are going over the Gecko G320X from GeckoDrives.com. So let's go ahead and get started. It's laid out pretty intuitively. We have all the terminals down here at the bottom. We have our section for the dip switches up here. We have our LEDs here for status. And we have our trim pots up here for P, I, D, and T. Let me go ahead and label these so you have a visual reference. There you go. All right, now let's actually talk about what all these things do. So first thing is first, we actually have to get this connected to the power supply, and the first terminal is for power ground. And of course the next one is power positive, and both of these get connected to your AC to DC main power supply. After that we have our armature negative and our armature positive. These both get connected to your actual servo motor. I have uh, these both connected to my motor, but my motor also has a ground wire, which I have connected to a star ground on my chassis. Uh, there's nowhere to hook it up to ground on this. Now we have our air slash reset terminal pin. This is uh, what outputs an error and also where you go to reset from an error. I can't really make it out here because of the glare, but this is also our encoder ground coming up. This goes out to the actual encoder, followed naturally by 5 volt positive going out to the encoder. Now the next two pins that go out to the encoder are channel A and channel B respectively. And our last three are the ones that go out to the actual breakout board and they are direction, step, and common. Now let's talk a little bit how I have this wired. The first terminal of power ground I have wired to the negative side of my uh, power supply, it's DC output. The second terminal I have wired to the positive coming out of my DC side of the power supply. Now the third pin armature negative I have wired to the negative wire on my servo motor. And the fourth pin armature positive I have wired to the positive wire on my servo motor. Now you can wire the fifth pin, which is air reset, um, to in many different configurations. One is going to a reset switch, or a, a break, another breakout that actually has a readout and switches. For now, let's talk about the five wires that come up next that hook up to the encoder itself. The first one is encoder ground that goes to the ground on the encoder. The next one is encoder positive. That's the five volt that goes to the positive on the encoder. Next up we have channel A, which goes to, of course, channel A on the encoder. And the last wire we have is channel B. Interesting thing though is um, if you start seeing erratic behavior, uh, a lot of jumping around or a lot of faults keep getting triggered, you might have these wires or your armature wires reversed. So keep an eye out for that. Now the last three wires on the uh, driver are for direction, step, and common. These are the wires that actually come from the breakout board uh, that actually control the driver telling it um, which way to go, which would be direction, how many steps to take in that direction, and common is for either 5 volt power or ground coming from the board depending on how you have it set up. Now coming back to the error reset pin, um, I have mine jumpered and I do this because this way it just never goes into fault because I don't have a readout or reset switch for this. And also here I have it marked wrong. I have it going to the ground of the encoder when really it goes to the 5 volt uh, positive of the encoder. And all this does is just keeps it from going into fault if you don't have a fault reset switch because you would normally just have the error pin touch to 5 volts for a second in order to reset the server from, or sorry, the servo from a fault condition. Now let's talk about LEDs. The first one is in position. It is green. It stays lit if the servo motor is within two increments of being in its proper position. The second one is worn, which is yellow. This one will get triggered if it's more than 128 increments out of uh, position. The third LED is fault and it goes red if your encoder gets disconnected or if there's a short circuit or some of the encoder wires aren't plugged in or the thing's completely out of position. This is uh, in order to 
throw a brake on everything so it doesn't get out of hand, but mine won't do anything because I have the air pin jumpered. Probably not the safest thing in the world. Finally, we have the power LED. It's green and it just lets you know if there's power. Now let's talk about the 10 dip switches. If you have any of the switches switched over to the left, that turns them on. Switched over to the right, turns them off. The first switch is marked as not being used. The second and third switch, though, are marked as being multiplier 1 and multiplier 0, respectively. And from my understanding, what the multiplication does is it affects how many times the motor rotates given a step. So if you set the multiplier to 2, it'll rotate twice as much as it normally would. For instance, if you have uh, the multiplier for mole 1 and mole 0 both set on to on, then that will multiply it by 1, which I believe is the default. And if you set multiplier 0 switch 3 to off and multiple, uh, multiplier 1 switch 2 to on, that will multiply by 2. And if you set pin or switch 3 multiplier 0 to on and pin 2 multiplier 1 to off, that will multiply everything by 5. And if you set the both switches to off, that will multiply everything by 10. I suppose one application of this could be that if you had your system geared down pretty heavy and it was too slow for you, you might be able to multiply the steps and try to get some speed out of it. To me, this kind of seems like uh, micro-stepping with stepper motors, but in the opposite way. Instead of trying to get more resolution, you're trying to get more speed. So you sacrifice speed for accuracy. Next up, we have pins 4 and 5, which are SR1 and SR0, respectively. These set the error limits on the controller, so um, how many errors to receive until it starts to get itchy. Now there's a whole entire formula on how to calculate this uh, based on the motor RPM and whatnot, but the rule of thumb that I've received is that you want to set it to be about half of the lines that your encoder can do, mine can do. 512 so I've got mine set to 256 which is the default. That being said uh, that's the on and on position for these sets it to 256. On for 5 and off for 4 turns it to 512. Switch 5 off switch 4 on sets it to 1024 and both switches off set it to 2048. Number six is the head switch. This is if you have a optical encoder, heads encoder. Um, you want this on. It's defaulted to off, but I believe the older version of the 320 had it to where you had, if you wanted to use this, it used different current, so you had to set up resistors, capacitors, etc., to actually use something like my US Digital E5 digital encoder. But if you switch this on, it'll go ahead and take care of that for you. It's defaulted to off. Switch 7 is for torque. Um, if you have this off, what will happen is it will allow the motor when it hits a significant load to run at 20 amps for one second before it starts respecting what's set on the trim uh, teapot. Um, if you have it set to on, then it will just always just respect what you have your tea trim pot set to. 10, 9, and 8, from what I've been told, control gain going into the PID circuitry, particularly the P in the PID. Um, I'm not going to go through all the settings, I'll write them out here, but basically you have lowest, uh, low, medium, low, medium 1, which is the default, medium 2, um, then you're going to have medium high, and then high and, and highest. And basically, um, if you start running out of room with your ability to adjust the the uh, PID circuitry, you can increase or decrease the gain I'm going into it, I believe. And finally, we have the PID and T trim pots. Um, PID is for your PID control, T is for the uh, current limit that you want to set it to, either 0 to 20 amps, respectively. So if you have it at 0, it's 0 amps. If you have it at midnight, it's you know 10. If you have it full all the way, it's uh, the full 20. And this also goes back to what you also have set for your torque switch, how this is used. In another video, I'll try to go over how a PID circuit actually works, but for now, I just have everything as it came defaulted to about 11 o'clock. Alright, party people, let me know if there's any questions, comments, or corrections. Thanks.